first reading appointed for this fourth of Sunday in Lent is from the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter, beginning with the fourth verse. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Here ends the first reading. O oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The second reading for this morning is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians, the second chapter beginning with the first verse. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. <clears throat> By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Here ends the reading of the epistle. Christ had humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written according to the third chapter of St. John, beginning with the 14th verse.
his deeds have been carried out in God. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And God's children say, Amen. Well, this morning, in the epistle reading and in the gospel reading, you heard two verses that we should all have memorized. And if you don't have them memorized yet, you should be working on them. The first one is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest man should boast. That's the first one. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the foundation of our faith. That's why we believe, because God has given us faith as a gift. That's how come we're saved, by grace. Not anything that we have done. Nothing good in us deserves God's love, by grace. It is strictly God's love for us that makes us his people, snatches us from the devil, and gives us eternal life. The second verse that you should have memorized if you haven't already, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Again, this explains how God saves us. He saves us through faith, through believing in Jesus. No other way. And it shows God's love. He doesn't demand anything out of us. He doesn't make us do anything. Even our faith is a gift. You see, it's God's grace, and it does take faith to be saved. But even the faith is something that God gives us so that we can look to Jesus. Miley, Miley I saw you looking at the Kranich painting on your way up here. You know, in the Old Testament lesson, there was a bit where we talk about the fiery serpents and how Moses lifts up the, the bronze serpent in the wilderness, and that that's what the people were to look to. Well, today, we are to look to Jesus, because only through Jesus do we have the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And every time we hear God's word, every time we trust in him, that's how we keep our trusting in Jesus, looking to him. And that's where we find our salvation, in him alone. Well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you give us something to cling to. That our faith is not just in thin air, but in our son Jesus Christ. We look to him and to his cross for our salvation. We thank you that there's nothing good in us that deserves our forgiveness. Because if there were, then we would always be wondering if we were truly saved. But because of your great mercy and love, we can know without a doubt. Washed in the waters of holy baptism, having heard your forgiveness spoken, having received it through the sacraments and your means of grace, we know that we are your beloved children. Thank you for such undeserved gifts. Thank you for the salvation and eternal life that you give us through faith in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
that old or new, he's the one to look to for your healing, life, and salvation. Because while it might not seem possible, there's not much difference between the people then and you and I today. We are tempted, tormented, and afflicted by the same sins as they were. We're bitten by the same serpents and filled with the same poisonous venom which needs the same cure. The cure that I'm talking about is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Granted, not no fiery serpent has literally sank his teeth into your hands while you were out raking the leaves or doing yard work. But just like the people then, you too have been injected with a horrible venom. You have been bitten by the serpent. You too are filled with a poison which will lead to your eternal death if the antidote is not administered. For the snake which bites us is the devil. The poison which we all have coursing through us is an unhealthy desire to sin. But thanks be to God. Just as he did for the disobedient Israelites, he has done for you and for me, provided the cure. Remember, God did not just send the snakes to torture the people. The people had become impatient. They wanted God to run according to their schedule, their desires, their way not the other way around. Their will, their way, not God's will. That's what they want. And left unchecked, that is always the way that leads to death, snake or no snakes. Remember, as Moses said, the people spoke against God and against Moses, saying, we, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Spoke against God. The audacity. Even though he had delivered them, they had already forgotten the first and second commandments. They were not trusting that God knew what was good and right for them. They were not calling upon the name of the Lord in every trouble, pray, praising and giving thanks to him. Instead, they were grumbling not trusting, not content. They had been disobedient. And they did not like the punishment that God was dishing out on them. They didn't like wandering in the wilderness. And they could not see that what God was doing in their lives was for their good. They thought it would be better to be back in slavery and bondage in Egypt than be with the Lord. We do this too. We fail to see God's hand in everything always working for our good, no matter how it might look. In unbelief, we too think that God is not providing for us the way that He should. We think that we deserve something more, something better than what the Lord offers or places in our lives. And we too loathe the worthless gifts that God gives. This woman you gave me? This lazy husband you shackled me with? These disobedient children? What have I done to deserve these things? This body that is failing and giving out on me? Or how about those stupid teachers? My overbearing boss? This lousy job? Or this ungrateful church? All such thoughts are sins and betray the poison that is coursing through our veins. All show our grumbling against God right along with those ungrateful, grumbling Israelites. And if that wasn't enough, they broke the third and the eighth commands as well. They outright lied and failed at putting the best construction on what God was doing for them and giving to them. When the people were brought to the very gates of the promised land, there were those who wanted to go back to the flesh pots, the leeks and garlic of Egypt. There were those spies who 
who refused to trust what the Lord has told them and instead wanted to trust their guts and what that was telling them. The Lord had said, go in, take the land I provided for you, it's yours. But there were some who said, we can't, there are giants in the land, it's too great a task. You see, these were the people who did not trust the Lord and his word to be true. Yes, there were strong people in the land. But what did that matter if God was on your side? But looking around, they took what they saw and heard and allowed their human reason and what their hearts were telling them to trump what the Lord God had told them. And of course, we're no different. When we let the things of this world trump the word of God. When we let the ways of the world have the last word over the word of God, we're no different. Because when we want to follow what everyone else is doing, allowing, or encouraging, we're going against God, just as they did. For example, just because government says the birth control, even birth control that kills the unborn should be provided by and for church workers. That's no reason for us to abandon God's word and follow the way which encourages murder and sexual promiscuity and wickedness. Even though the world says that living outside of marriage is okay, perhaps even good and noble because it shows a higher commitment than a one-night stand does, that doesn't mean that we can condone it as God's people. When the culture says that sports on Sunday morning or school activities on Wednesday night are more important than coming to church because it'd be wrong to let the team down or the coach or the teacher because, hey, you can always go to church, but you might lose your place on the team. We as God's people must say no. Rather than wring our hands and raise the white flag of truce with the temptations of the old evil foe, we must stand firm and say we would rather obey God than men. Because it's His word, not ours, which are the words of eternal life that we need to hear and put first in our lives. Well, I know, so harsh, so unloving, so unreasonable, Israelites thought the same of God and Moses then. Bitten with sinful desires, they broke the fourth commandment as well, saying, who are you to speak this way to us? Keep speaking like that and the church will die out here in the wilderness of orthodox historic Lutheran teaching and practice. Because just like the grumblings of the Israelites, when we grumble against the truth of God's word and want to go back to the old Egypt of this world, we're no different. Our hearts are tempted to, be, to think that it would be better to be enslaved to false teaching than feel like we are different than everyone else. Because just as the children of Israel felt that the Lord had abandoned them, we feel the same way as we look at the world around us, so different and out of step. You see, they wanted more than they felt God was giving them. Remember, the people claimed they had no water. Now, why did lie? God had provided water from the rock which followed them. They claimed they had no food. Another lie, because God had provided flocks and herds for their food and sacrifice. He provided them the very food from heaven itself, manna, every day. God's own miraculous bread of life given to his people come down from above. So what on earth were they saying? What they did. In their ignorance, they were just spouting off lies, misconstruing the truth to fit their own perceived notion of what the truth was. But finally, thanks be to God, God sending those fiery servants, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord would take away these servants from us. And so Moses did pray for the Thanks be to God. God, true to his word and promise, provided the answer. He provided the antidote. He provided forgiveness. Because just like the Israelites of old, we too have been afflicted by the fiery servants. 
Each one of us will perish because of the poison which courses through our veins. For each one of us has been bit by the serpent who sunk his fangs into the innocent flesh of Adam and Eve by convincing them that they didn't need to listen to God's word and that they knew what was best for themselves. For just as the Apostle Paul rightly wrote, For sin and death came into this world through the first Adam, and the wages of sin is death. And, but also life and salvation has come into this world the second Adam, the perfect Adam, the one who in his flesh has provided the antidote for the sting of death which afflicts each one of us, the antidote to the poisonous bite of the serpent the devil which has slithered into our own homes, a serpent so cunning that no locked door and no bolted window can keep him out, because the old evil foe, that serpent from the garden, we can get into the very cracks of our thoughts and minds, through the slits of our eyes and through the holes in our ears, through words and images. That's how he gets in today. Through books, movie, TV, radio, music, and computers. And oh yes, the bite of the old people foe is just as deadly for us as it was for those fiery servants back then. Because the devil, with his poison, it can work slow or it can take effect quickly, but if left unchecked, the result is the same. Fiery, burning, eternal death in hell for those who don't look to the one who provides the antidote for that disease and that venom. And thanks be to God again. The God of Israel, your God and my God, has provided an answer. He's given us something to look to and be healed by. In his great love for us and for the whole world, he has given his only begotten Son to be high and lifted up for the whole world to see and to look to for its sins. Because it's on the cross, nailed to that tree, dying a shameful sinner's death for your sins and mine, your Lord is that bronze servant. Bitten with the poison of our sin, your Lord Jesus Christ has become sin for you. And like the bronze servant, he took on the form of a servant that you might look to him and live. And not according to the glory of your achievements, but in the glory of his humiliating death. Bruised and bitten himself, feeling the agonizing sting of death, God's Son defeats death, the grave, sin, and the devil for you, for your Lord to crush the head of the servant that would destroy you, just as was promised to Adam and Eve. He has not done this in the fiery image of Mount Sinai, where no animal and no sinful person may come near, but rather he has done it here for you when he calls out to you through his word, forgiving you your sins, where he gives you the eternal water which follows you through your whole life in your baptism, because you have been clothed in his righteousness, which is a garment which will never wear out. Because he has chosen to feed you, his people today, with the eternal life-giving bread which comes down from heaven above in the sacrament of the altar. Because your Lord cares for you so much, loves you so much, he does discipline you. He has it so that you can hear the preaching of the law, so that you can know your sins and recognize them and repent of them. And not content to just heal your body of a life-threatening poison for the here and now. Your Lord and God has given you an eternal healing with an eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ, by looking to Him in faith. That's God's grace. That He gives you the cross. That He gives you His Son. And you have been baptized into His name, believing on account of the grace of God, which is our faith in you, that you have been healed through His means, through Jesus, through the Word, and through the sacrament. That's why we look to Him and live. In Jesus' name, Amen. May the peace of God which passes